Good morning or afternoon or evening, whichever time you've chosen to join us in our study of the book of Isaiah. Today's lesson is the first of 13 planned lessons to cover the book of Isaiah this summer during the months of June, July, and August. That will give us 13 weeks to cover 66 chapters. If you're doing the mental math on this, that means we're going to cover a little over five chapters each week, uh, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. But this will certainly preclude a verse-by-verse -verse study. We'll really be focusing on the overall message of the book and looking at various sections of the book and the message of each section and how they relate to the overall message of the book. Our goal in this study is to help develop an overview of the book or a framework that you can use for future study. And the book of Isaiah really will require a lifetime of study. Its subject matter and uh, is so uh, deep in places that uh, you can always study it more and learn more. Our tentative schedule for the summer study is to start with the introduction this Sunday, and then in succeeding weeks, look at chapters 1 through 6, 7 through 12, and so on, uh, trying to finish with chapter 66 by the last Sunday in August. I've included my email at the bottom of this schedule as well. I encourage you to use that uh, to make comments and to uh, ask questions that you may have. Uh, I'll try to answer some of those individually. Uh, some I may be able to uh, use uh, in future lessons. Uh, if there are thoughts that several people express that they'd like for us to consider or pursue. The Book of Isaiah is considered by many to be the masterpiece of classic Hebrew literature. George L. Robinson says that Isaiah has no superior or even a rival for versatility of expression and brilliance of imagery. Robinson argues that Isaiah is a perfect artist in words. His writing is filled with beautifully picturesque illustrations, with epigrams and metaphors, with interrogation and dialogue, with antithesis and alliteration, with hyperbole and a number of parables, Students of the Hebrew language tell us that it's filled with poetic wordplay that's often lost in translation, but plainly apparent to readers in the original language. Also, the book is ascribed the most extensive vocabulary of any of the Old Testament books. Uh, certainly, the other Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, use 1,500 to 1,600 uh, different words in their course of their writing, whereas Isaiah uses over 2,100 different words, unique words, uh, which in fact is uh, more words than we find in all the Psalms uh, put together, even though the Psalms were written by a number of individuals, uh, some identified and some anonymous, over much longer period of time. The diverse vocabulary of Isaiah has caused some to object to the idea of a single author, although really the primary reason people have begun, especially over the last two centuries, to object to the idea of a single author has to do with the accuracy of the descriptions of the Babylonian captivity in return. The book mentions specifically by name uh, the, the Persian Empire and their part in bringing down Babylon, and specifically uh, even Cyrus, the individual who decrees, uh, issues the decree allowing the Jews to return from captivity. And as well, others have argued that there's just such a radical difference between the first 39 chapters and the last 27 chapters. 
while this may trouble some at first hearing, these objections are easily refuted. The last third is very different from the first two thirds, but this is common to many books. In fact, in fact most of the prophets, like Isaiah, have a two-part message, beginning first with the bad news, often a message of judgment because of unfaithfulness, and then the good news, the hope and consolation, much as Moses had talked about the blessings and the curses, the blessings that would follow if they were disobedient, the curses that would follow, the blessings if they were obedient, and the curses if they were disobedient. And so the prophets really address this in reverse. The judgment, the curses, because of their disobedience, just as Moses had prophesied, followed by goodness because of God's grace. Uh, he didn't have to redeem remnant of Israel, but he did. And so in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, we see the story of the failure of man and the impending judgment, whereas in the last 27 chapters, we see a message of grace and deliverance. This is easy to remember if you think about the Bible as a whole, containing 66 books, like the 66 chapters of Isaiah first 39 books of our Bible are very different from the last 27 books. The first 39 books focus on the failure of man and their need for a savior. In the last 27 books, the New Testament talks about and focuses on God's grace, and deliverance through the Messiah and the, the establishment of a messianic kingdom. This is much the same division that you see in the book of Isaiah. Perhaps the simplest division that every student should start with when they think about how to uh, organize their thoughts about the book. Many books of the Bible, in fact, have a two-part message. It doesn't mean that they have two authors. Most of Paul's letters have one section that is mainly doctrinal and one section that's mainly practical application. It doesn't mean two authors, it just means two themes, often two themes, but in a united way. The objection that the, the book is too accurate is really a circular argument that's made versus many books of the Bible. It's argued that Daniel could not have written during the Babylonian time period because of what he has to say so accurately about the Persian and Greek empires that followed and so the conclusion that's reached is since Daniel couldn't have known these things uh, 600 years before Christ, he must have written them 200 years before Christ. But this is uh, just circular reasoning. It's the same argument that's used when Isaiah mentions Cyrus by name uh, two centuries before he's born. He mentions Cyrus in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, then again in chapter 45, verses 1 through 13. And so some have concluded that this section of Isaiah had to be written, written much later. And they propose uh, the earlier part was written by one man and the latter part was written by another man. Of course, there's no end to this because then some looking at the second part would argue that no, that's not one additional man, but there's really two or three additional men in there. And so they jump from two authors to three to four to five authors. But it's all based on the premise that man cannot predict the future. Isaiah had to write later because he described things that were unknown seven centuries before Christ. And it couldn't have been known until four centuries before Christ. While this premise is based on the idea that man cannot predict the future, it ignores the fact that God can predict the future. In fact, this is an argument that's made in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 11. If you look at Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 11, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. God says through Isaiah, Remember the former things long past, 
For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, a man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. Well, man cannot control events in this way. God can, God's power is unlimited and his ability to reveal his plan before it takes place. It's one of God's characteristics. The idea also that Isaiah was written by more than one author is refuted by the New Testament writers and Jesus himself. Isaiah is quoted by name 21 times in the New Testament, more than all the other prophets combined. There are many more quotations and allusions where Isaiah's name is not specifically mentioned, but the quote is clearly uh, from Isaiah or an allusion to Isaiah. The Lord begins his public ministry by reading from Isaiah 61 and applying this passage to himself, reading in the synagogue, proclaiming that the scripture was fulfilled in him and then having a seat. Jesus quotes from the beginning, the middle and end of Isaiah and he attributes these scriptures to a single author. If one accepts that the book is written by multiple authors, one would have to discredit Jesus as a false teacher because Jesus rejected this idea. Isaiah's prophecies occurred during the same general time period of Hosea, Amos, and Micah. While Hosea and Amos prophesied near or just before Isaiah's work began, and they prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel, Micah and Isaiah prophesied in Judah, just south of Israel. Micah focusing his work in rural Judah between Jerusalem and the sea and the foothills between the, the coastal tidelands and the mountains in which the capital was located. Jer uh, Isaiah, of course, is in the capital city of Jerusalem and is a part of the royal family life. And while one might think of Micah as the, the country preacher in Judah, Jew Isaiah is certainly the city preacher, the erudite preacher, uh, who writes extensively and preaches extensively uh, to the most prominent, uh, powerful people within the nation. The conditions, interestingly enough, both in the northern and southern kingdom at this time, uh, under the reign of Jeroboam II in the north and Isaiah in the south, south were the most prosperous reign since the times of Solomon, when the kingdom, the United Kingdom had been divided at Solomon's death. During the times of Jeroboam II and Isaiah of Judah, borders were expanded, a return of general prosperity and even much luxury occurred. This was often interpreted by the people of the day as approval from God, despite increased idolatry and immorality, increased exploitation of the poor and disadvantaged, increased neglect of God and his laws, and an increased focus on materialism. All of these things, themes of both Hosea and Amos, of Micah and Isaiah. There's much similarity uh, in their works, and especially between Micah and Isaiah, who prophesied at the exact same time in the exact same nation, one simply uh, to the rural folk and one to the urban folk. 
but their their message is similar because they're just talking to two different audiences. Uh, just as one would expect if one were to, to read much of the things that are being written about uh, COVID-19. Since the same issue is being talked about, uh, much of the same things are going to be said. Some things, in fact, may even be identical if a, a common source is being used like the Surgeon General or some uh, national or international health organization or political statement from a governor's office. And so we see the same thing occurring in Isaiah and Micah. It's not that one person copied from the other person, but both simply are proclaiming the same message to two different audiences. And indeed, both have a common source, not a political or health organization, but God Almighty. Since this is likely the first and only time that we're going to be ahead in our schedule, I would like to go ahead this week and look at the first chapter of Isaiah's text and see how it is in many ways an overview of all that we've, we've said about the whole book. Beginning in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version, we read the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And so we mentioned the family that Isaiah came from, Amoz. We mentioned his focus on the nations of Judah uh, and the capital city of Jerusalem. We see the time period and then the four kings, Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Isaiah continues in verse 2, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. As an ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. We see the unfaithfulness described in contrast to uh, a mere animal that would at least have some loyalty to the one that fed and cared for it. God's people have ignored God's blessings and lost sight of the source of these gifts and have no faithfulness or no loyalty. They've abandoned the Lord. They've despised the Holy One. They've turned away our three descriptions in verse 4. Isaiah goes on to say in verse 5, Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, not softened with oil. We see in many ways that this alludes back to the idea of the curses that were going to occur if Judah was unfaithful, if Israel was unfaithful, that their continued disobedience would result in escalated punishment from uh, beginning with things such as uh, drought and famine, uh, pestilence, uh, and continued disobedience would result in increased pressure to uh, reform. And when all of that was ignored, the ultimate penalty would be to be carried into captivity by a foreign nation. And so this is what lies ahead of Isaiah, uh, of uh, what lies ahead of Israel at the hands of Assyria and Judah at the hands of Babylonia. God says in verse 7, your hand is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your fields 
Strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. So there is a hint of hope, even at the outset of this book. But God's complaint, seen in verses 10 and following, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moons, festivals, and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me, and I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. What God is rejecting, even though these are things that he had commanded, he had commanded the Sabbaths and the new moons and the feast. He had demanded the sacrifices, uh, the offering of incense, but not just going through the motions. That was unacceptable to God. He wanted to be these to be honest expressions of the heart, and they weren't so in Israel and Judah. They were just actions to check off of a list so that they continue, could continue about their own interests, uh, leaving God out of their plans and desires, focusing on self and self-satisfaction, convenience, uh, mistreating others so that their actions uh, outside of the temple uh, spoke louder than any actions inside the temple. God's plea through Isaiah in verse 16 is that they would wash themselves, make themselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds, deeds from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, approve the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. They, though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by my sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah, Isaiah's message is that there's still a hope for repentance and a possibility to avoid the judgment. And indeed, uh, some of Isaiah's efforts and Hezekiah's effort will result in another century of existence uh, past the time that Israel goes into Assyrian captivity. But ultimately, judgment comes to Judah as well. Uh, in 605 BC, when the Babylonians begin the first stage of their cap, uh, captivity of the Judah, uh, which ultimately uh, ended in the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC and 70 years of, of captivity before being uh, released after the fall of the Babylonian Empire and the beginning of the reign of Cyrus. Isaiah concludes his first chapter, noting that the faithful city has become a harlot, she who was full of justice, righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your drink diluted with water, your rulers are rebels and the companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphanate. The orphan, 
nor does the widow's plea come before them. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, Ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. I will also turn, on, turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and will remove all your alloy. Then I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning and that you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. The transgressors and sinners will be crushed together and those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. Surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired and you will be embarrassed at the gardens which you have chosen. For you will be like the oak whose leaf fades away or as the garden that has no water. The strong man will become tender, his work also a spark. Thus they shall both burn together, and there will be none to quench them. So even at the end of this first chapter, predicting judgment and doom, there's still a hope that's held forth that ultimately good Will be the end of God's plan and God's dealing with man. Again, we appreciate so much your joining us in this study. Look forward to the next 12 weeks and hopefully uh, I will get the hang of the technical aspects of, of recording this and uh, I'm thankful for those who have provided help and accept responsibility for any of the uh, glitches that occur and we'll try to improve as we go along. Thank you for joining us in this study and encourage you to participate as we go along. God bless.